Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for introduction as introduced. My name is Hyun Gyeong Gang. Well, actually, the previous speaker talked extensively on the ICHQ 3D. So I will uh, be very brief on the guideline itself, but I will focus more on the our approach in reviewing the products in relation to the guideline. And I also wanted to share some cases, but the thing is, there are some confidentiality issues, so they are, therefore I just cannot share all the details of the actual review and approval cases. So I will go over briefly the background of the guideline and the contents, and I will provide some uh, risk assessment examples. And the revision two of Q34 is a hot topic, so I will go over that. And I also talk about the MFDS position on the ICH Q3D R2 revision. And actually, MFD has already shared its position, so I will just briefly mention that. So when it comes to the development background, and as you know, as for the elemental impurities, before we control them as individual elemental impurities, we focus on the total heavy element. It is whether it is A, U, P, S, P, K, P, it was controlled as total heavy elements. However, there were some issues like the toxicity of individual impurities need to be considered and there were only limited uh, impurities that can be detected and the low level impurities were not detected. And now we have a very advanced analytical tools. So, Q8, 9, 10 of ICH as we implement them and the uh, understanding of the quality and risk management has been very much improved. So there were uh, a lot of background behind the development of this guideline. So ICH Q3D Step 4 was signed off in 2014. So it was implemented in many different countries in Korea, uh, although a little bit late. We started to implement it in 2017. Although we had a guideline, it didn't mean that it was a mandatory. And now we have the domestic guideline in April 2019. And after that, we had a greater period. So starting from September 2019, the elemental impurities data became required data. So USP EP, if you look at them, until 2017, the total heavy metal was the uh, standard in control. But afterwards, it was taken out and then the uh, elemental impurities control as an individual uh, impurities were started to be controlled. So now all the impurities, elemental impurities became, many of them became the required item for control and also for data submission. And for Korea, it started from September 30th of 2020. And if you look at the relevant regulation in Article 33, the inorganic salt and elemental impurities, their uh, items for control need to be set considering uh, dosage and regimen and others. And regulation and reviewing and authorization of drug products also says that the residual or in uh, potential to be incorporated lead, cadmium, arsenic, and mercury and other elemental impurities need to be provided with the data to uh, show the qualification 
less than the qualification level. So maybe there was some cases where the changes occurred at the time of this uh, regulation implementation, but all new drug products registered or approved after September 30th of 2020, this regulation is applied. And I think the industry is following the guideline quite well. If you look at the details of the guideline, I believe that the scope is important. ICHQ3D focuses on the risk assessment and also the safety control of the elemental impurities. So in drug product, PDE for individual elemental impurities are set. That's what the guideline is talking about. And if you look at the scope, as you can see, new drugs and existing approved drugs, generic drugs, everything need to be included in here. And what is unique here is that there are some items where quality data is not a requirement, but this does not mean that the company do not conduct the risk assessment. Although they do not submit the data to the agency, they have to have that information. Generics, existing approved drug and new drugs are all covered by the ICH guideline here. And purified protein and polypeptide are also in the scope. However, uh, the recombinant genetic drugs or cell culture based drugs, although they are based on the polypeptide, they would not be covered. And however, drugs, radiopharmaceuticals, vaccines, or the dialysate solutions not intended for systemic circulation, and these are not in the scope. Um, I have to correct myself because I said something wrong. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, the recombinant genetic drugs and the cell culture based drugs are in the scope. So depending on the toxicity, class one, two, three are assigned to the elemental impurities. And we have 24 elemental impurities here. The yellow one in this table represent the ones that the companies do the risk assessment although we do not see or we do not predict them to be detected, but still the risk assessment is needed. And there are some red color ones. In 20, this is the revision from the original guideline. Last year, the inhalation PDE for cadmium was revised. And this year in the revision to nickel and silver and gold, their PDE were revised. So this is to show there were some revision. So the early next year, you will see the MFDS revised the guideline in accordance with that. In order to submit to the MFDS on the risk assessment of the elemental impurities, you need to identify the source of, ele of elemental impurities, whether it is intended or intended or just potentially present. You need to identify the source of elemental impurities. And also you need to evaluate whether they are actually present in the drug product. You can measure or you can expect it by comparing to PDE. And then the result of that evaluation need to be summarized and documented, and it should be submitted to the MFDS. For risk assessment, the PDE of each elemental impurities need to be utilized so that it is not exceeded. The identifying the source of in elemental impurities. You need to consider the pathway 
to produce the pee. In the pathway, you may have, you of course have water, uh, you may have manufacturing equipment, yes, CCS, and excipient. In every component, you have to look at if there is any possibility for elemental impurities to be included. For the manufacturing equipment, you need to have the process understanding and equipment qualification and the GMP compliance. Those are uh, the things that can be utilized. And for water, you of course follow the water related specification. So if you use PW or WFI, there wouldn't be no, uh, not much of a risk of having or including the uh, impurities, elemental impurities. The catalyst or inorganic reagent which are entered or added, you need to look at them for the potential uh, elemental impurities. Sometimes some elemental impurities are not intentionally added, but they are having a larger potential to be included. So you have to assess them. Here, the yellow part, these are the ones you do not intentionally add, but still these are the ones that have high possibility of being included in the process or in the DP. And there can be elementary impurities derived from the manufacturing equipment. So you need to assess the uh, manufacturing equipment. And depending on the formulation of the EP, the possibility of having or incorporating elementary impurities for, from the manufacturing equipment may be different. So as for the solid, formulation, it is not likely for the elemental impurities to be included from the manufacturing equipment. However, for the solutions, suspension, we need to do the reachable testing to see it. For CCS, likewise, we need to look at and assess the possibility of elemental impurities to be included. So, we conducted risk assessment, then we need to get the measurement or expected level of that elemental impurity and compare it against the PDE and then establish the control strategy. So the PDE and measured concentration can be converted and there are four ways of this conversion. So if you read the guideline, actually, you can see the options, option number one. When we calculate elemental impurity, of course, that is also true for the genotoxicity. The daily intake of DP uh, would be as a maximum 10 gram. So the worst case would be 10, 10 gram. Then the common permitted concentration limit is applied then uh, it is divided by the daily intake of the P. The PDE is divided by the daily intake. The option 2A, the actual maximum daily intake is used. If the daily intake is quite large, then this uh, option is taken many times. For 2B, the actual maximum daily intake is used and then the total or the sum of individual elemental impurities actual distribution is applied. For option 3, the actual maximum uh, daily uh, intake is used and not considering the concentration of the elemental impurities, the elemental impurity concentration in DP is used. And actually, option three is most widely used. 
when we set the control strategy, what is important is that the elemental impurity in DP uh, does not exceed PDE. And here, uh, the control threshold is set at 30% of the PDE. So that is compared to the level of elemental impurities in DP. So if it's lesser than 30% of the PDE, then uh, you don't have to do the further control. You just can control it through the GMP process or uh, through the incoming material control process. But if it's higher than the control threshold, then you have to also provide some data and you have to consider the variability. So the actual manufacturing scale three load or pilot scale six load. Sometimes you may not have the actual manufacturing scale three load when you uh, submit. However, the batch variability need to be considered and therefore this data should be Submit it. Only then you can be waived from setting the control threshold or the level of elemental impurities for the control threshold. And if you have changes to the process, manufacturing process, or when you set the specification for DSDP excipients or CCS, so you always have to control the level of the uh, elemental impurities lesser than the 30% of the PDE, which is the control threshold. So this is an example. Let's say the maximum daily intake is 2.5 G and components, nine components. This is the oral solid. MCC, cross bovidin, arsenic, HPMC, and titanium dioxide and iron dioxide. So you have the component here. In this case, for each component, the elemental impurities that can be included from each component need to be checked and the actual amount need to be calculated and then compared. So this is how you can submit or you can go for option three. You assess the elemental impurities in the drug products and compare it with the PDE. But we sometimes see the data uh, based on the option one. So polarim and nickel are intentionally used and for others, they were not added on purpose. And elemental impurities like arsenic, PB, which are falling into the class one, there are many. And from the uh, equipment, manufacturing equipment, and from the CCS here, you know, this is the solid. So there is no possibility of inclusion from all the component. So here, polarim, nickel, lead, cardamom, arsenic, and vanadium. And these are the ones that were assessed to be in, to maybe include to be uh, to have the potential of being included. So the analysis was done in order to calculate the concentration. So the S here, let's say 0.2 uh, milligram is used. Lead is not detected arsenic, 0.5 cadmium and mercury, no palladium was added. About 20 nickel, about 50. For uh, MCC, you can see the numbers. So compared to the daily intake and actual concentration measured, so you, by utilizing these two numbers, you can see that for each elemental impurity, you can have the contribution, daily contribution. For lead, 1.1, and arsenic, 0.8, cardamom, 0.7, like that. 
So contribution and control threshold were compared. So everything is lesser than, lower than 30%, which means that there is no need for the control strategy. So if you submit this kind of data, then MFDS will say that you don't have to have additional or the further control strategy. However, for the measured concentration, for example, for one lot, you know, for DS, the actual manufacturing size, three batch or the six batch data need to be included. We do not accept the data if it's only on one batch. So let's say it's one batch of DS or research batch, then it would not be accepted. And for the revision two of ICHQ3D, it's a quite a hot issue. So if I talk about it a little bit, PDE for oral, parenteral, and inhalation were set. So cutaneous and percutaneous products PDE made an issue before. So this time, the PDE are included for those type of route. It covers local and systemic acting cutaneous and percutaneous product. It includes, uh, but it does not uh, apply to mucosal, local ophthalmics or recta or derma and others. And actually this is covered by parenterals. And how do we calculate the PDE here? The PDE per day for cutaneous product. Parental PDE is applied with a CMF. CMF, how do we use it? Most of the elemental impurities on the normal skin, their skin absorption is lower than 1%. So the, the skin absorption, which is lower than 1% is applied. Arsenic and thallium are the exception. And after that, other than that, CBA is 1% for all other elements impurities but there can be some other factors that can in increase the CBA because some factors are utilized in DP in order to increase the percutaneous absorption so factor 10 is applied and that is adjusted CPA so about 10 percent so in order to calculate CMF Parental bioavailability is 10, 100%, and then it is divided by adjusted CBA. So except for arsenic and thallium, the uh, cutaneous PDE would be the parental PDE multiplied by CMF, meaning the parental PDE multiplied by 10. That's what the revision says. But for arsenic, particularly inorganic arsenic, percutaneous absorption rate is much higher, like five times higher than others. So adjusted CBA is 5% multiplied by 10, so 50%. So CMF is divided by 50%, meaning that it is two. So uh, skin PDE, cutaneous PDE for arsenic would be two times of parenteral PDE. For thallium, it is well observed in skin. So it is quite equivalent to the parenteral level. So the PDE, uh, the cutaneous PDE of thallium is the same with the number four no, uh, parenteral PDE. For nickel and cobalt, the PDE is provided, but at the same time, CTCL is recommended too. For the sanitized, for sanitized persons, these 
uh, element can create or generate skin reactions. So that's why CTCL is set for this elemental impurities. So for nickel, we know that the thermal limit is a 0.5 microgram per square centimeter per week. So cutaneous DP, if it is applied on 250 square centimeter area of skin, if that is the case, then CTCL for nickel is 35 microgram per day. For cobalt, the dermal limit is about 31 to 259 ppm. So here again, the CTCL is on about 35 microgram per gram per day. So the risk assessment for cutaneous and percutaneous product, like in the oral parental inhalation, it is done in accordance with ICHQ 3D Section 5. Elementary impurities are identified and the actual amount is compared to PDE and then control strategy is established. So the process itself is the same, but for nickel and cobalt, not just the PT, PDE, but also CTCL value need to be considered. So the nickel and cobalt should be lower than PDE and should not exceed CTCL. But the problem is that for cutaneous product, maximum daily dose is not easy to calculate. So I know that many companies are having issues with that. So in this case, you can apply worst case for risk assessment. It's not just for the cutaneous product, however. Even oral product, the worst case, daily dose can be used to set PDE. But for the cutaneous product, the worst case scenario need to be adopted. So this is the revised version, oral parenteral inhalation, cutaneous and percutaneous, and there is a CTCL, nickel and cobalt. You can see the number. For cutaneous and percutaneous product, for this seven, items, although they are not intentionally added, the risk assessment should be done. That's what the guideline uh, recommends. So PDE for cutaneous, one, uh, 10 gram per day, then concentration is like tenth, one tenth of the PDE for skin product. And 30% of that would be the control threshold. And for cobalt and nickel, CTCL, 35 here. So for those uh, elemental impurities, both category, PDE and CTCL, must be satisfied. Lastly, I want to talk about how MFDS conducts the review on elemental impurities. The relevant body at the MFTS had a discussion and we actually shared it already with industry but I will just summarize it. We do have uh, some regulations like 31st, Article 31st of Pharmaceutical Affairs Act and 4 and 5 of the Regulation on Safety of Medicinal Product and 7 of Regulation on Pharmaceutical Approval, Notification and Review and also Regulation on Prior Review of Pharmaceuticals. They are the legal basis. And it covers the manufacturer and importer of DSDP and the covered items include all the items that are manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing, marketing, and import approval is applied. And as I said, we do not distinguish the
the OTC and prescription drugs for DS. Registration of the MF and approval of DS or registration of DS or the API for DS, which is imported. So as I said, starting from 30th of September 2020, the elemental impurities data need to be uh, submitted. And if there is any change to the process, then from the same date, you need to do the assessment whether such a change impact the elemental impurities. And if your uh, assessment says that you need to do again the risk assessment on the elemental impurities, then you have to do it and submit the data. For DP, from the same date, the new application, and for the prior review, which includes orphan drugs, And there are some products that the CMOs got the uh, approval before September 30th of 2020s. But the manufacturing itself starts from that date, then uh, they should be provided the data. And changes to the manufacturing process. If that happens or planned after uh, September 30th of 2020, you need to do the self-assessment. And if you believe that the safety or the qualification of the elemental impurities need to be done again, then the data need to be submitted. So there are uh, some issues with the elemental impurities. One thing is that without identification, just the three lot data is provided or the suitability of the lot is not checked. So these are uh, one of the frequently pointed out issue. And for the changes, the previous manufacturing process or the method and the change it method need to be compared and the self risk assessment need to be done. And after that, the safety or the qualification of the elemental impurity, the data need to be provided. And there are many questions about that. There is a guideline on the assessment of the uh, elemental impurities and also the Q&A, which was published by the MFDS. So you can refer to that document for your information. That would be end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Deputy Director Kang. We will have the Q&A session now, and I will check if there is any questions from the uh, on-site participants. No questions from the on-site participants, but there are many questions from the offline participants. There are quite a number of the questions and I will check. Uh, you can check the question and you can respond to some of them first. Before September 30th of 2020, there was an approved product and there is no changes to the approval details. Is it a requirement to do the elemental impurities? Well, you don't have to submit the data to us, but you have to do the qualification or the risk assessment on the impurities, the elemental impurities that is required under GMP. So you have to do it and you have it. Although it is, on, it is not a requirement submission to us at the moment. Is it, uh, can you pick other question? One more question to respond. For ophthalmics, let's say the manufacturing equipment, containers and everything are the same, but the filling volume is different. If that is the case, do we have to provide three batches measurement for each different filling volume? Well, if everything being equal, we do not require three batch measurement for each different filling volume. However, we will check whether all conditions are really equal or not. 
Thank you very much, Deputy Director Kang. There were many questions online. I really appreciate your participation. Once again, I appreciate the presenter. Thank you.